All right, uh, I'm John Robb. Thank you uh, very much for coming. Um, as some of you may know, I'm part of the Zimber team. So we were acquired in February. This is, I think, my third uh, VM, uh, VMworld, and my first as an employee. So I'm very glad uh, to be here uh, and glad to be part of VMware. As you've seen from uh, this morning's presentation, there's definitely a lot of excitement and a lot of movement as uh, the company transitioned and looks up the stack. And part of what we want to talk about today is that exact thing and what's happening. Um, so one thing I want to say up front is I promise you the best demo that you've seen today, I'm going to do that at the end, so you guys, you guys can come tell me afterwards if I uh, let you down, but I promise you the best demo that you'll see today. Um, so let me give you, you know, 10 or 15 seconds on who Zimbra is, just for some context of kind of where this deck came from. Um, we are an email and calendar system. We compete with Microsoft Exchange. We have some large customers like Bechtel and H&R Block and Mozilla and Dig and Comcast. When, when you work for these companies or you're a user of these companies, when you log in your email and calendar every day uh, is Zimbra. Uh, we're a very web-centric application. We're a very SaaS-centric application. That's why a lot of the themes are going to come through here about how applications need to transition to being SaaS. Uh, we happen to be a behind-the-firewall solution. So a lot of times you hear about SaaS and you hear about SaaS being uh, public cloud only. Um, that's not going to be the case here. We're going to talk about SaaS as a generic concept, uh, and then you can apply it to either the private or the public cloud. All right. Um, so what are the things we're going to cover before the best demo you've uh, seen today? Um, so trends for uh, delivering applications and users, administrators, and data centers. What, what key technologies are driving these, these trends? What's happening in terms of the evolution of how we as uh, members of the IT community are, are delivering these applications? How do we score the applications in the market? And then I'll, I'll give you a score of Zimbra. Of course, uh, not going to give us a perfect score, because uh, I think there's some things we should be working on, but you guys can give us a, a sense of that. Some end user demos of how we're trying to match up with uh, with what we think um, IT leads uh, need to be doing to bring SaaS-style services into the market, and then some session takeaways. One of the things I'd love for everyone to think about as we go through this, and particularly come up to me afterwards, is I have this notion of a, of a scorecard where we all can generically look at Google Apps or Salesforce or Success Factors or Workday, whatever the application might be, and score them based on whether or not they're delivering uh, the kind of software to meet your needs. All right, so let me start with uh, a, few, a few analyst comments, and, and then uh, we'll jump into some of the more specifics. So first comment, Ted from Forrester, 37% 30, of US workers are, are using do-it-yourself technology, Skype, iPads, other things. Paul talked about in the keynote. This is just some uh, stats behind it. The second stat, cloud email and collaboration, is uh, about 2% of the enterprise email market. Uh, I think this is an interesting one because we need to keep measuring how fast our application is moving to the cloud. I don't care if it's email or calendar, but everyone in this room is thinking about which applications are moving, how quickly are they moving. Uh, in the case of email and calendar, we're now at uh, 2%. And then uh, the bottom one, Chris from Forrester says, um, he believes that the, what's happened in the PC markets where people want bundled hardware it's going to happen in the software market. People want software stacks. They don't want independent software layers uh, because it creates a lot of uh, management overhead and updates uh, deployment and in management. So some, some bullets behind uh, one, one of the stats there from, uh, from Gardner, which is, OK, so you said that the, the transition to the cloud isn't happening as fast as some people uh, would have predicted. You see at the top you have private email and, uh, and calendar. And you see that pretty big numbers with relatively small growth, 14% 14 growth you see. And then you see the, the public cloud with 69% growth. So the, I think this is happening across the application stack, whether it's email, whether it's CRM, whether it's uh, um, travel systems, you're seeing a transition. Some things are happening faster. It sure feels like in CRM that th that's happening quite a bit faster. Uh, some things are happening slower. Uh, and I think we all have uh, our, our own view on kind of whether or not these, these data points are right or whether, whether or not they'll go faster or slower. So the three areas that we've been trying to break down as we evaluate our own application, as we evaluate some of our partners uh, that we ship with, 
are what are the things we need to be doing uh, in order to provide a SaaS style application. The first thing is the end users are saying any device, any application, anywhere access, access to rich content, online or offline. Uh, many of these were the key themes that, that Paul hit on in the, in the keynote. The two on the right, I think, are some of the ones I'd be interested uh, in hearing, hearing from folks uh, from in the Q&A session as well as afterwards, which is what, what's also happening at the application layer? What's happening in terms of the, your, the changes in expectations around applications? Are you getting simpler admini uh, administration and management? Are you getting self-service? Are you getting automatic updates? Are you able to quickly deploy the application? Are you able to control security policies and have service levels? So at the application level, regardless of where the application's running, you're starting to think about how can I have a simpler, uh, simpler experience for deploying, for administering, and then for updating. And then down in the bottom, as you look at the data center, you start to think about, all right, do I want this at a public cloud or I want to run it myself? Uh, can the application move between those two places so that I can competitively have these two, uh, two you know, vendors compete with each other in terms of where my application runs? Can my application be neutralized so that it can move between, uh, across the two worlds? And then are the other investments I make, whether it's storage, HA, management, and other things, are they able to integrate into the application so that each application doesn't have its own set of policies around backups, HA, storage integration, or other things? So I'm going to talk about each of these uh, distinctly and then talk about some examples uh, that we all see in the market. So in terms of end users, obviously anywhere, uh, anywhere access, home, work, airport, hotel. I think one of the things get, that gets lost in this is it's not just browser-based because there's a need for offline data. We all see, particularly at a show like this, uh, that you have moments where the Wi-Fi is dropping and you, you, have, you have trouble being connected. So you want access both online and offline. And then the ability br to bring your own device, which uh, the Forrester uh, quote uh, brought up there. Device independent access, whether it's mobile, PC, laptops, netbooks. Synchronization between data on different, uh, different PCs or different devices. So whether it's your authentication, whether it's your passwords, whether it's your data, you want some level of synchronization across the devices because uh, you're no longer dependent on one. In some cases, the device may not, may not be smart enough or have enough uh, capability to sync all the data. So you need to decide to what degree do you, do you want full sync and offline capabilities. And then the two uh, that I think the most work is happening in 2010 around is data transfer between applications. And you're really seeing this in the consumer space where you have you know, com arch rival competitors like Facebook or LinkedIn or uh, Twitter where you're seeing address book information being shared across the two, authentication being shared across the two, uh, the ability to post, uh, post messages across the, the different systems, the level of interoperability you see in the consumer space for authentication, for data sharing, and for uh, UI integration uh, is dramatically increased. And then multi-point access. Uh, gone are the days where you logged into one experience to get to that data. It's now a mode where uh, you want to access it from multiple places. So you don't want to judge an application explicitly on the single interface uh, you get to access it. So some of the folks that I think are doing interesting things in this space, Dropbox, Salesforce, LinkedIn, 1Password, Xmarks, as I get into the demo, I'll show a few of these uh, as to how I think they relate um, to what's happening in the market. So I think the basic concept is, is known from everyone here, which is as you look to bring this data across multiple devices or different places, what you're looking for is persona, authentication, and data, and applications going across uh, these devices, whether it be browser-based, whether it be offline. Uh, you want basically a personal cloud to access this, this information. Now, some specific examples that I think are really good at this. I talked about Dropbox. I think Box.net and Evernote uh, are hitting on this really well, uh, which is the ability to sync uh, to multiple devices, the, the ability to access the native file management. And I think this is, a, this is a key one, is an application being able to not just be browser-based, but being able to be able to have a native uh, support for the iPad or native support uh, for an Android device. Um, this combination of browser-based as well as native access uh, is, is something that's changed this year. I think last year was the year of the browser, and this year everyone's talking about the app. And I think the reason uh, th that's the case is you're seeing a better experience for some native applications. Doesn't apply to all devices, 
uh, certainly uh, feels like it doesn't apply to something like a, a desktop device, but it certainly applies to the mobile devices. Uh, so the browser-based access is a minimum of uh, the native uh, capabilities for offline and rich user experience. And then, of course, no bias to the OS, the browser, and the mobile devices. This is something I think is unique to, to VMware, is just that we don't have much of an agenda in terms of uh, what OS you're running on the device, what OS uh, you're running on your PC. We don't have a, a bias, whether it's Chrome or Safari or IE, whatever it might be. Uh, and the same goes for the mobile device. If you want an iPhone, great. If you want Android, great. Uh, what you're seeing is many of the other major vendors in the market are aligning around uh, a complete stack. And I think there's nothing wrong with having a reference stack uh, to make sure there's a best of breed set of capabilities. Uh, but it's dangerous. As we all see, uh, we can't control what people end up bringing into the office. If 40% of uh, the applications and the experiences are coming from external places, uh, we need to be open to uh, uh, having this uh, ground uh, change out from under us uh, unexpectedly. Uh, and if you have a set of applications that are neutral, then you're in a better position. So I talked about kind of files. Here's another example that I think uh, is, is a good one. Um, and we talked about the TriCypher announcement this morning, but bringing persona everywhere. So um, whether it be authentication into other apps or being able to log into your main app, whether it be browser history, bookmarks, what open tabs you might have, what profiles you might have, uh, password sync, OAuth, all these things. Again, you want this data coming with you uh, in the uh, in a cloud and then being delivered to the device uh, that, that matters. So transitioning from kind of the requirements of the end user, what's happening in the market with the end users based on some of these other SaaS services, you can look and see what's happening from the administrator level. And I, I really tried to abstract this away from um, public, public clouds, uh, although I think the public cloud providers are the best at this right now. Uh, and, and distill it down to what is it from an administrative standpoint that people expect in the market. They want easy to deploy, 10 minutes or less. Uh, they want self-service setup and migration. They don't want to have to manage the OS and the, and the application independent of each other. They, they want them bundled together so you don't have to deal with, um, with you know, different installation uh, steps. From an operation standpoint, you want to move towards more web-based administration so you can access it where you need. Obviously, there's uh, command line interfaces uh, when you need to get into advanced administration. You have service level management so that you can create a consolidated, um, you can create a consolidated experience for, for your users. Uh, you look at some of our customers like UPenn uh, and Bechtel, and two really cool things they've done is, is they have a consolidated IT department where they provide services for you know, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 users, and then they cross-charge the departments a monthly fee uh, for the use uh, of the product. And they cross-charge them differently depending upon if they have mobile sync or offline or, or uh, unlimited storage, whatever it might be. They bit the, built the internal processes uh, where they're able to do per-user cross-charging internally. We see that in the public cloud. Don't see it as much happening uh, uh, behind the firewall. Uh, no reason it can't be done, though, if the application supports it and if the underlying IT infrastructure supports it. You think about things like remote device wipes. So as you move the data to the, to the cloud, to what degree can you reach out and, and uh, uh, pull off, you know, shut down the data on a device? Dropbox has done this well. Uh, some of the active sync capabilities do this well, where you can actually go into Exchange or go into Zimbra or go into Dropbox, and you can reach out and pick a particular device or a particular desktop and shut off uh, access to that. You want, uh, additionally from an administrative standpoint, the ability for either the admin or the end users to do backups. I think one of the, one of the transitions that's happening is that the end users expecting that they can have more control over the, uh, over, the, over the system and they want to be able to decide when they want to do backups, when they want to do restores, if they accidentally delete something. They don't want to feel like they have to contact someone. They'd, they want a web-based interface where they can do a restore of their data if they ac accidentally deleted something. And then obviously the administrator will want that ability as well. And then as you get into lifecycle management, uh, automatic update notifications, um, so the ability to be notified when either the OS uh, or the application has changed, and then the ability to obviously update the OS and the application, and then an advanced use case is being able to do rolling upgrades of both the OS uh, and the application. 
some of the folks who've obviously done this well, uh, Google just recently, even though they're a competitor of my product, uh, they recently announced a service level management where they do have these tiers of service and they do have the ability to create these tiers uh, so you can have a centralized experience for folks. As you look at kind of what's happening in the data center, we talked about the end user, we talked about what's happening for uh, at the application stack, now at the, at the data center side, um, you want portability because you want competition between your own infrastructure and the infrastructure you choose to rent uh, from public service providers. You want high availability. Uh, you want that to be application ag agnostic. You don't want each app that, that arrives to have its own DR policies, its own clustering uh, uh, policies, and its own management policies. You want to be able to have a set of tools that you can apply to that application uh, and then decide um, to what degree uh, you want to have differences between each of the applications. And then rolling updates, uh, as I talked about. And then you, of course, want some policy controls. You want the ability to have storage and archiving and decide at a per user level to what degree you're going to have archiving capabilities. Uh, and then um, to what degree you want to have integration with third parties. You saw uh, Noah talk this morning about Horizon and how the ability you can reach out to an application and deprovision a user having this level of policy controls around being able to, uh, when an employee quits, to immediately shut off their sales force, their email account, their uh, workday account, whatever it might be, uh, being able to, to reach out and do that from a centralized interface, whether it be an application running behind the firewall or whether it be uh, a public service. And then efficient storage utilization. Uh, again, this gets into that many of the applications historically have had certain levels of storage optimizations embedded in the application. Uh, whether it be certain uh, you know, hierarchical storage management solutions or whether it be uh, certain clustering around storage, uh, the application uh, needs to be able to support third-party capabilities uh, to do that. The application itself might have some of these capabilities, which is great, um, but in many cases you'll end up with storage across a wide range of applications and you want consistent policies across that. All right, kind of, so switching out of, out of the trends and getting into some more specifics. So what are some of the key technologies uh, that we're seeing driving this? Uh, HTML5, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, Arcade Fire Google demo of uh, their, uh, they did a video, uh, music video that uh, they announced yesterday. Unbelievable demonstration of HTML5. I encourage folks, check it out when you get back to uh, a place where you got high bandwidth, where it takes a interactive Google map of, of a house and then uh, that you grew up in and then overlays it inside the music video and so while they're doing the video you're seeing uh, an interaction of a place you know inside the inside the video and then they're doing a lot with the browser um, to really show how rich a browser experience can get. Obviously browser plugins i.e. Firefox, Mozilla Chrome you're seeing the need for plugins for things like voice uh, for things like rich uh, authentication for smart card authentication so even though we're, we're transitioning more and more to the browser, uh, there's a need for plugins, uh, and you're seeing those being driven by security, uh, voice, or rich applications. In terms of authentication, Noah talked this morning about SAML and OAuth and OpenID. Um, uh, I, it was a very interesting announcement uh, this week that uh, Twitter came out and said, if you're a third-party application, you no longer can use basic auth to, to connect to Twitter. You must switch to OAuth. And if you don't, by tomorrow, you're going to be shut off. So you know, there's a, a few hundred developers around the world that are going to be up all night tonight uh, implementing OAuth uh, so that they have consistent uh, authentication and integration with, with, uh, with Twitter. And you're going to see, I think, this move to the enterprise as well, where people are going to need to move to standards-based authentication. SOAP and REST for application data sharing. I talked about how in Twitter you can see your, your contact buddies uh, from other systems. Uh, you're able to post messages between uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other places. So this notion of opening up the data and opening up the application so that you can interact with it where you want. And then OVF, uh, which uh, Steve talked about this morning around application portability. Uh, this is uh, what gives you the ability to take your app and run it in your own data center and then choose to move it out to the public cloud. So getting into some specifics around how the evolution is happening and how these technologies are applying. So in the old world, you have obviously legacy applications and devices 
where your authentication and your persona and your settings are based on uh, the device. Uh, the applications, uh, a certain set of the applications remain on the device, uh, whether it be Office, uh, whether it be software development, whether it be multimedia, those are all obviously running locally these days. And then you have the traditional OSs. Uh, in some cases, you'll of course have desktop virtualization. Uh, and then the, the primary store of your data is on device on the file system. We see this a lot, particularly with music and with Outlook PST files, that the, the primary uh, data store for that data happens to be on your PC. So if something happens to your PC, uh, you're at risk of losing some of that data if it hasn't been backed up. Obviously, there's other examples of that, but I think those are the two areas where people are most concerned about uh, losing data. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the shift towards cloud-centric uh, device agnostic authentication, which uh, was hit in the keynote with Horizon. You're seeing the shift, uh, particularly with certain applications like collaboration, corporate productivity, or social media, where those apps are moving to the web, they're moving to uh, simplified administration, those applications are portable, and then you're seeing all of a sudden the browser inserting itself uh, as a significant portion of the overall experience. On the left-hand side, the browser is somewhat ir ir irrelevant. On the right-hand side, as you look at travel apps or CRM or social media, all of a sudden the browser is the dominant uh, uh, interface or view into the back end, and the OS plays a, a, a less significant role in terms of the user's expectations. Obviously, you still need an abstraction layer uh, to get to that hardware. And then the cloud file system, moving your data to the cloud so that it now can be accessed anywhere, whether it's music, whether it's persona data, whether it's uh, email, you know, moving that back to the cloud. All right, uh, so some people have, you know, as I've talked to some of our customers about this, you know, one of the, one of the key questions they have is, is, all right, how do I actually implement this? What kind of scorecards can you give me so I can start judging some of my applications? Um, so as you look at persona today, it's, uh, you want to be de decoupling it from the OS. You want to decouple it from the device. Uh, secondarily, as you look forward, you want to uh, decouple it from the applications. And then as you move to the right, you want to put that end user policy, uh, move the standards-based authentication into the cloud. From an application level, you, have, um, you want to move the applications into the data center. The more you move to the data center, whether it be CRM, email, whatever it might be, it's going to be easier to manage and to deliver to a wide range of users. You want to identify where do you want applications to be sharing data? Where are the places where you want applications to be exposed uh, in, in different environments? You want to start looking at uh, mo moving towards frameworks and not OSs, so moving towards HTML5, moves, moving towards uh, standards-based browser uh, capabilities. You want a consistent online and offline experience. This is something that I think, uh, as we look at the last few years, everything shifted to the browser, but the offline experience uh, has gotten an order of magnitude worse. Uh, the offline experience is no longer in line with what you expect uh, uh, from what the browser experience is. And then the apps, as you go into the future, um, these applications are being delivered as a personal cloud where you get that data, get that persona uh, across a wide range of devices. And then this notion of information sharing between the apps. The last layer, the OS and the device, obviously a, a step along the way is uh, bring the desktops back into the data center with virtualization, introduce the browser, mobile uh, device support is the next step, and then going forward, this, this mix of native and browser-based uh, um, access modes into the device or the PC. So what I, what I tried to do was come up with a, a basic scorecard, and then I'll have a more advanced one on the, the next slide, which is some of the new applications in the market how are they doing uh, versus some of these standards? So desktop productivity, some of the new apps like Zoho, Google Apps, great end user experience, great administrative experience. You don't have a choice around portability of where that's running. So you don't have controls over storage and policy management around what's happening on the back end. In purchasing, uh, you have systems like Oracle that you can run yourself. Bad news is they're not so good with multi-browser support. Uh, but then you have folks like Zora uh, the, who've come into the market that are, that are really strong uh, on the end user administrative side, but they're SaaS-based applications. In the travel space, you're seeing a shift towards, uh, towards the cloud, folks like Reardon Commerce, uh, where they have a great uh, experience for users to go in, book flights, book uh, airlines, cabs, whatever it might be, 
and then administrative controls over that. Again, in this case, uh, they haven't uh, made the next jump to make that available for you to run yourself. In terms of messaging, um, Google Apps, obviously, uh, um, very good end user experience, uh, more administrative controls like the, I talked about with the service management, but no ability to run that, to run that locally. I was in Australia last week, and I was with a, uh, a customer of VMware, and they said, you know, I, I'm, I'm a university, and one of my students made a, a, did something illegal uh, with their Google Apps account, and there's now concern in the, the local uh, Australian authorities around whether or not that kid needs to be extradited to the U.S. Uh, for having violated U.S. law and Australian law, and whether or not they could actually uh, enforce that locally without the U.S. getting involved. And so there's real fears here around you know, where, where are these applications and data running and does it meet uh, certain, local, certain local rules and laws? In the collaboration space, you're seeing a mix. I think this is one of, the, one of the best areas in terms of you have folks like Socialcast and Jive that allow for on-premise capabilities that meet many of these criteria, and then you have some folks like Yammer, which are cloud-only solutions. In CRM, obviously, the, the big leader is Salesforce. Uh, with their cloud-based uh, solution. Then you have Sugar, Sugar CRM that meets these criteria but also has uh, data center capabilities. I left that box off given Salesforce is the, is the real leader there. And then in performance management, you have success factors uh, with, uh, with meeting many of these criteria. So what, what I wanted to do before we get into the demo was kind of give you my scorecard. This is the thing I'd love to hear people's feedback in the Q&A uh, as well as afterwards, which is, uh, do you agree with this list? I'm going to score Zimbra against this, so you guys can tell me uh, if we're doing okay or not. Um, but end user, location independent access, device independent, open applications, we've talked about that. From the administrative standpoint, hitting these three areas around easy to deploy, easy to operate, and then easy uh, to manage the life cycle. And then at the bottom, the data center around application portability, high availability, uh, policy controls, and efficient storage utilization. So hopefully, it isn't a surprise because it's uh, uh, a bit of a copy and paste from s some of the previous slides. All right, so here's how I think we're doing. So I tried to be as balanced as I could. If anyone knows us well, you can uh, uh, edit it for me. But um, location independent access. We have browser-based access. We have an offline cache, which I'll show you in the demo. Uh, we haven't done an HTML5-based implementation where there's some additional offline capabilities. So we're looking at that, trying to decide if that's the right thing to do. In terms of device independent access, uh, I talked about that you know, in the previous few uh, years, I think browser-based access was the only criteria. And I think the shift uh, from browser apps to native apps uh, is, is changing. The, there's a wired uh, uh, cover that said the internet is dead. It was kind of a, a bit of a joke. But if you looked at some of the stats around the percentage of internet traffic and what percentage of it is browser-based versus voice versus videos versus music, you're seeing a, a dramatic decline in the portion of the web tra traffic that's browser-based. Um, and so one of the things we need to think about is uh, our native mobile apps. Open applications, so having SOAP-based access, having OAuth support, and then adding SAML and other things are things uh, we're looking at going down the, ro down the road here. In terms of deployment, we do have an appliance, so that's good news. You can install it in 10 minutes, uh, but we don't have great APIs so that if you want to install multiple servers of the appliance for a large deployment, that you'd be able to do that. The software supports you know, million user plus deployments, but if you want to do it in the appliance form factor, you can't do that today. On the operations side, we have the ability to do a mobile device wipe, uh, but we don't uh, have mobile uh, have device wipe of our offline client, which I'll show you. And you don't have the ability for the end user to do a self-service restore of part of their mailbox that they've lost or some of the data that they've lost. And then in terms of lifecycle management, we, with the appliance, provide the uh, application OS updates. Uh, we have, in the future, uh, the ability to do the rolling up, up updates of the appliance. And then in terms of the data center, uh, we have the OVF support. Uh, so you have the portability. I think there's some more management we can do there. You have the ability to have generic uh, clustering and high availability solutions, whether they be Red Hat or whether they be uh, VMware provided. Uh, and there's some things we can do with Site Recovery Manager we were just talking about uh, over, in, uh, um, over in the Middle East doing the ability to, to have a, a local version of the application then be back it up in the UK. Uh, and uh, so we have some work to do there. 
and then policy management, uh, integrating with third-party policy controls, and then uh, um, we've done some storage integration. So we, we think we're doing okay on some of these. Uh, we think we have uh, room, room to go on this, but I'd be interested in folks' uh, opinion of kind of, are these the right things to be judging apps by? What are the categories I'm missing? Uh, what are some of the things uh, that also come into play for you? So I'm going to jump into about 10 minutes of demos or so and then open it up to, to Q&A for folks. All right, um, so the first thing I wanted to um, show was, so this is a Zimber interface, uh, and I'm going to show you some of the things we're trying to do to kind of meet these criteria that we talked about, which is, Let's go ahead and open up the email inbox so that it can interop, uh, interop with other applications. So one of the things we said was that Google's the best translator on the web. They do an awesome job of translating different languages. So let's see if we can integrate Google into, uh, into uh, the product. And then let's, let's go ahead and allow you on a particular email message to just say, why don't I go ahead and translate this into Chinese. Uh, left and right, you see the, the difference between the two. The, the value of, of the application in this space is, is not about the fact that um, the email product itself provides this translate capabilities. It's the ability to open it up so that you could choose to integrate with different th solutions and to create a marketplace where these different apps can come in to interoperate with each other. So a big, big part of our time is spent just trying to open the app up because we, we don't want to control how the app interacts with services you may choose to run internally. I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you another example here, which is uh, someone asked us about doing travel integration. So could we integrate with an external travel system, a Reardon Commerce, or whatever, whatever it might be? So you can click on a flight number, and it'll go off into Reardon Commerce, or you know, Expedia, or whatever it might be, whatever your internal backend system is, and pull up flight information about that. So just open up the platform, let it interact with other things, uh, let it interact with Yahoo, uh, for uh, you know, maps of airports and weather.com and uh, this flight tracker system, whatever it might be. So uh, another more kind of advanced case, uh, and this is a, a partner of ours where we just did a blog post today, was actually going out and integrating our file store with a web-based Microsoft project uh, and Microsoft Excel, a web-based tool. So this company is called Smartsheet. Um, they wanted to do an integration on the, on the platform where you could go ahead and integrate with uh, the back end with, uh, you see in this case, it's like a Microsoft project uh, being pulled in. And the thing that's nice here is this is being pulled in in an iframe. There's nothing we did here. Uh, this is using standards web-based technology where they can pull this data in, and then if they choose, uh, they can have certain levels of integration uh, with the product that makes sense. So you could go to attach a file, and it could go off and ask you if you want to attach it from the, the Zimber briefcase. Or in their case, you'll see there's references in here to saying, do you want to open it as Google Docs? Open up the platform, allow these different applications to interoperate with each other. And you see some of the other uh, things that they've done around more of an Excel uh, use case. Uh, but again, we're just trying to, you know, uh, lim limit the constraints that we put on folks by just opening the system up. So the last two I'm going to show you, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A, is uh, social, which is another integration we did where we tried to pull in using OAuth and using some of these things we talked about, pull in uh, a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed uh, right into the system. Again, you know, we, we don't want to be a social network. There's already very successful ones out there, whether it's Chatter or LinkedIn or whatever it might be. Pull that in, allow uh, a, a view of that data. Now, you may choose to access Twitter using your mobile device, using the, uh, I think Uber Tweet I read yesterday is the, be is the most used uh, uh, Twitter client. So you have different ways in which you want to access this data. Uh, and this is just another way in which you can get at it, uh, depending upon uh, what the use case is and where you want to get at this data. So the last thing I'm going to show is we talked about this notion of online and offline applications, that you want the ability for the online application, which you just saw, to also be able to go offline. And you don't want a disjointed experience. You don't want the offline client to feel totally different than the online experience. So one of the things 
uh, you see many people working on is trying to have a consistent experience. You've seen this in the consumer space with some of the things that uh, the you know, TweetDeck and other folks have done where you get a consistent experience web or, or offline. So let me go ahead and minimize the browser here. And then I'm going to go ahead and launch our offline client, uh, which uses some technology from Mozilla uh, where it allows you to take your application offline. This is uh, going ahead and launching my mailbox, which is, I think, about 13 gigs, something like that. And you're going to see the user experience and how that compares to, uh, to our web-based uh, web experience. So you see, in this case, hopefully you see a resemblance between uh, our online experience and offline experience. Uh, when I hover over my, uh, my work file here, let me... Over over my work file here, you see, you know, this is, uh, you know, 12.5 gig of mail that's being pulled offline. You see Gmail messages and my live inbox uh, getting pulled in here and getting synced so you can take it offline. Same experience Windows, Mac, or Linux. Same experience whether you're online uh, or offline, and then you have these integrations just like you did uh, on the browser. So trying to create this level of abstraction, whether you're online or offline, uh, that you get the same feature set. So as you look to, to integrate some of your applications, whether it be a travel app, whether they be, uh-oh. Uh thank you, thank you. Uh, someone posting a, a tweet about this session. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so you know, having a consistent experience between online and offline. I think there's a lot of interesting technologies here. Uh, Adobe has some technologies. Um, uh, in this space. Mozilla has some technologies in this space. HTML5 is, is, holds the promise of being uh, capable of allowing you to take this data offline. I think uh, we're a little nervous about whether or not you can take 13 gigs offline with HTML5 in the first version, but I think over time uh, we think that that's the direction going forward. So I'm going to show the last uh, demo, uh, then open it up uh, for, for, for questions, which is I'm going to go into Firefox here, um, and one of the things we've done, uh, we, this is a, uh, one of the things we worked with uh, the Xbox, uh, the Xmarks team uh, on uh, for this uh, for this session, was the ability to come into Xmarks. You go into the settings, and you can actually choose where to put this persona data. So you see at the bottom, I've chosen to store this data. It's all my cookies, all my browser history, all my passwords. I'm choosing to store that out at a, uh, an internal server that's in the VMware, uh, inside the network, behind the firewall. Uh, so all that data is being stored. It's not getting synced off to some public cloud where uh, VMware wouldn't have control over it. And then I can go into the status update and if I want to synchronize the bookmarks or the passwords, whatever it might be, I can do that. We'll see if it works. We were having some proxy issues earlier, but uh, ho hopefully it will. Uh, yeah, try it one more time and then give up. All right, that synced, uh, synced successfully. So uh, I'll put up the summary slide, and I would love to open it up to, to questions, particularly on uh, scorecard or anything else. Uh, so in terms of the takeaways, uh, SaaS apps are changing for the data center, for the end user, for the administrator, and trying to separate these three layers. Um, score all your applications. Uh, hopefully my scorecard's a, a good starting point for that, um, to decide uh, are they SaaS ready to be run yourself or to be run in a, uh, a public cloud. And then look at some of these new technologies and start to decide to what degree are your vendors um, chasing after these technologies and trying to follow them. Whether it's authentication, whether it's moving to browser-based, or whether it's HTML5, there's a set of these trends happening. So uh, that's it. Uh, questions, comments, scorecard, feedback? Yeah? What's that? OK, demo. Was the demo OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, all right, I'll, I'll take questions up here if anyone has uh, questions. Thank you uh, very much.